I had worked with uh, Thomas Newman before because he had scored American Beauty, and I, I, I think he's such a brilliant composer. Um, we asked him to compose the music first, just to compose a 90-second piece of music. Well, I mean, I, I'd met Alan Ball uh, during American Beauty, um, and I, I certainly loved his work, and um, he called me and asked me to see a pilot for Six Feet Under, uh, which I was happy to do. Usually, you, you do picture first and then you add music. Um, we did it the other way around just because, I think basically because we didn't have any idea what we wanted picture-wise. And then the way that Tom likes to work, which was worked well with us, is that he would sit down and talk with us, and then he would go off and come back with a CD on which he had burned in like 15 sketches. These would be like 30 seconds or so of music, not with a theme melody written, but with totally different textures, sounds, colors, and just sort of feel what kind of groove struck us intuitively as the right tone for the show. We talked about, you know, starting with a kind of something, something kind of that, that evoked something celestial or heavenly, which was always for me, I guess, kind of a raised fourth degree. And then we took the pilot that was finished and Tom's theme music and sent that package to five of the leading visual effects houses and said, based on this, now come in and pitch your ideas. When Digital Kitchen came in and they had storyboards and everything uh, of basically what is the main title sequence now, they had four or five different concepts and we took uh, a piece here and there from the other concepts, but the main concept with the tree and the, the uh, sort of the hands coming apart, and that was theirs from the very beginning. And I remember looking at that and thinking, that's so elegant, you know, and it's, uh, it's so cinematic and it's so unlike TV, you know, and, and I just sort of went, I, I really love that. One of the things that we wanted to achieve in the title sequence, which was, one, again, one of the reasons that we let uh, the pitches come to us and that we encouraged Digital Kitchen to go their own way and come up with things that were beyond anything we had suggested was that we wanted something that you would see week after week after week and be entertained enough to keep watching. Something that wouldn't completely reveal itself on the first viewing. They basically did it on their own. You know, we of course met with them and gave them notes and uh and, and, and stayed involved in the process, but it was their concept and they executed it as well. Paul was the main person behind the ideas that came to us. And there, I know there were a large number of people who worked on this sequence, particularly in terms of the flame work and all of the various effects that had to be put on top of the actual footage. Um, but basically everything got channeled through Paul to us and from us back to Paul. The great thing about this project is that you know, all Alan Ball told us was that he, he really had no preconceived ideas in terms of um, what it was he was thinking. Uh, and if he did, he wouldn't share them with us anyway, because he wanted to make sure that he got the broadest spectrum of um, possible solutions back from us. The initial meeting was pretty fun and, uh, and scary at the same time, and not scary because of who we were presenting with. But when I left the meeting, it was scary because I thought they might buy the storyboard that we presented that had all this live action in. But it was really cool. We had four and really four tasteful solutions. We like to go in and cover the gamut. The, the thing about Digital Kitchen was it just jumped out. It's just, they showed me the storyboards and I saw it. Uh, it was very, very clearly thought out. It was, uh, it was a piece, it meant something. It, um, it wasn't just about getting the information across, it was about establishing the mood of the show. The first time I heard the track, I was completely blown away with it. I thought, um, it, 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 I thought it was going to be incredibly um, beneficial to me to edit to that piece of music because it's going to make me look like a great editor. Um, and one of the first visuals that we saw was a sketch that Danny did. And what we did at that point is we edited that to music. The main reason I had begun the animatic was because there were just some shots in stock that I couldn't find in order to tell the story that we really wanted to tell. And so we went ahead and just put it together in sketch form. Well, at this point, uh, we wanted to, you know, kind of put it to the test. And so we had drawn up a story animatic with very specific uh, shots on how we wanted to handle some of these things. This whole, uh, you know, where the, the mortician would travel, you know, what would happen uh, after a person's placed into a casket and goes in a hearse and, 
you know, what would the scene be like after the hearse was Tanner Cemetery, for example, how the type would appear on a tombstone. And then the, then the closing shot, um, I mean, maybe it's a, a thing where it's a casket going down into the earth. I did some initial stock research and I was inspired by a certain series of photos that I had found that had the gurney, you know, going down the hall. And then I searched along those lines. That was the strongest image for me. I really liked the way that it was just a singular object, just doing, it had a, a very strong story behind it, but it was also very beautiful. If I remember correctly, those feet on the gurney were part of their original storyboard. And I loved the fact that the actual titles themselves, the actors' names and, and the name of the show and the various production staff was, uh, I felt like the typeface was very elegant and it was smaller. You know, a lot of times in TV sequences, it's very big or you have to see the actors' faces. And that just felt so recognizable. And what I liked was the, the understatedness and the elegance of Digital Kitchen's approach. What we didn't know is how we'd put all that together. Again, it's music, but Eric Anderson did an insane job of, I think, going through all the revisions, but also always mining the best footage that we had, really making incredible use out of the material that we shot. We had probably, I don't know, uh, at least 30 versions of this thing. What I do is hopefully I'm making all these nerve connections like I have you know, a layer of muscle and a layer of skin, and the layer of muscle is the music piece, the layer of skin is the visual, and I, I create these um, nerve endings, and when I, when I feel that moment is happening, I think that's when the nerve endings between the two elements are aligned, and they're really working together. But uh, there are moments there that just feel like something's happening, you know, something bigger than the audio, bigger than the visual. Is, is happening here. They're working together to create this thing. I feel like the title sequence really captures the spirit of the show. It's, it's as if every single image works so perfectly with that music. And I think that has to be partly because it was designed with the music already in mind. Uh, there's that moment where the wheel on the gurney turns just as the percussion track uh, kicks in. It's such a wonderful synthesis of picture and, and audio um, that I, I, I still get chills when I watch it. One of the great things about Digital Kitchen from the moment they first brought us their first set of boards is that they have a very um, intuitive ability and a willingness to depart from linear logic. Um, the image of the photograph of the woman on the desk, which I particularly like because it's my credit, but uh, was something that had never really been discussed that kind of came out of left field, um, but it was such an elegant image and, a, and, a, and an appropriately wistful moment to object into all the other things that were going on that we all felt it was absolutely right from the moment we saw it. Oh, that's my mom. My dad was a bit of a hobbyist photographer. There are so many images in the title sequence that I just adore, uh, but the one that really remains with me is those two hands at the beginning and when they pull apart they go to slow motion and it's so perfect with the music and it's so heartbreaking you know because it is that once that moment of separation happens there's no going back but right here where the uh, hands part you can see the difference in the speed before and after where we settle on the hands and right to the music i do a pretty pretty fast speed ramp to emphasize how they how they break apart. Um, to me, that's what the music was telling me to do, and, and I'm, I was really happy with the moment it created. It, it really makes the drama of the hands parting um, emphasize that even more with the speed and the pause. This is another section that would, um, uh, we could say, we talk about the whittling away process of not only shots, but actual imagery in the shots. Um, we originally shot the close-up of the uh, mortician's hand with a, a skull ring on it. We thought it would kind of added maybe a dark humor. That type of humor, that type of moment in this piece wasn't that um, appropriate. We actually um, took off the ring in post-production. Here you see a shot you know, with the ring on it. That, that is the original shot, the original film with the skull ring. We magically removed it with one of our um, devices that we used in post-production called a flame. The thing that sticks out the most was the crow. 
that the picture of the of the crow, that the crow flying, the crow standing on the tombstone, was something they had come up with very early. That though every effects house had come in with some kind of death-related imagery, that that seemed something that was so not literally tied to the show, and not overly macabre, but so evocative of the darker feelings that the show would conjure up. Um, that we really clung to it. Well, the thing that we discovered about crows is that it is illegal to film true crows in the United States for commercial purposes. And the problem with the crow is it, it was like not very well trained. It was actually a pied crow. It has a white chest. So you paint the chest black so that it looks like a crow and you can use it. And it had to be on a leash because it didn't want to fly. So for all the close-ups and stuff, we used this crow and it, and it worked out fine. It was great. Uh, the other image, I think, that came out of those first uh, boards that they submitted was the tree. The tree, which has become really our logo. And the idea of a single tree, you know, standing on a kind of a flat, barren horizon with a big foreground of the, of the grass, of the hill. Um, and then the concept of the tree spouting some kind of roots. I think originally it was more like roots, but that would eventually envelop our title treatment, um, that was, it's so simple, but it's nothing that any of us ever could have thought up, and it just seems so right from the beginning. Oh, the tree was by far the hardest thing to find. Uh, we started weeks early, knowing that it would be really difficult. Um, it was the dead of winter, and we were looking for a tree with leaves, of course. And then the other thing is Seattle is covered with evergreen trees. It, it's just extremely difficult to find an, an empty hill. So whenever there was a designer free from another project, we would just send, like, send them out driving aimlessly, please find a tree with a Polaroid. When people started coming back with the same pictures of these kind of little pathetic trees, I knew we were, we were never gonna find a tree and a hill in, in the same place. So this is the uh, infamous Kite Hill. What we thought was gonna be an easy thing, finding a lone tree on a hill, ended up being rocket science. So finally, the day before, really, we were planning on shooting, this woman, you know, somebody contacted somebody who contacted somebody, and she wanted this tree cut out of her yard, and we paid her the $400, and we had the perfect tree for our hill. It was amazing. We were so lucky. Then the very next day, they came and cut it down early in the morning, like 8 o'clock in the morning, and they took it to Kite Hill, which is just like 15 minutes from here. Oh, I think it's thrilling. <laughs> you know, I, I look at it a hundred times and I go, is that my tree? I believe the last piece to be completed and the one that was the subject of the most mutual frustration and, and time consumption was the flowers. For that, we drew from another board we developed that was based on a classical American painting of this young woman holding this rose called We Both Shall Fade. The concept was to shoot funeral flower arrangements time-lapse as a symbol of the transitory nature of life. Anyway, after establishing how long it took for them to wilt, we hired a motion control operator, then rigged and photographed the wilting arrangement via stop motion over about 10 hours. The flowers wilted, but they didn't turn brown, so we took the sequence into the flame to shift the color and emphasize decomposition. All that footage was speed ramped to give it a sudden wilting quality. Ultimately, the title sequence, what I feel like it does so effectively is it transports you into the world of the show. You go on a journey. You go, I mean, it is a journey of the moment those hands come apart, you're on this journey and you're in the prep room. There's the presence of death. You go down a tunnel towards light. You go away from a body that's standing there. They disappear. Um, you actually see the funereal stuff, you know, the coffin, the, the hands, uh, uh, the hearse. Um, and then ultimately it all comes back to that same place with the uh, life proceeds from what has come before. I think that the theme music and the title sequence encapsulate the show so well in a, in a kind of branding way that it's all you need is the opening chords or the image of the tree and people, it's so evocative, people immediately know where you are, what you're talking about. So I feel that we, I don't want to tinker with that because we have something that evokes the show immediately for people and in a, in a very sophisticated and, and visually elegant way. Aside from the fact that they're, you know, really nice people and they're incredibly professional, 
uh, I just felt it was such a relief to say, here, do this. And when it came back to say, oh, thank you.